there was a gentleman from Florida whose company transferred him to Minnesota. And they transferred him to Minnesota. He lived in Florida all of his life. They transferred him on January 1st. So you can imagine somebody who left has come from Minnesota. He got up there, and he was an avid fisherman down here, but he knew nothing about the fishing up there. And he heard about ice fishing. And he said, well, that sounds like a lot of fun. And so he went to the fishing store, and he got one of these augers that they can drill through the ice with and all the equipment that he would need to go ice fishing. He found himself a good field of ice, and he walked out onto it, and he began to drill. And this voice, this booming voice, came from above, and it said, there are no fish there. He was kind of surprised, but he walked out farther on the ice, accepting the guidance that he got, and he started to drill another hole. And the voice said again, there are no fish there. Then he walked even farther out on the ice, he started to drill, and the voice said, there are no fish there either. And he looked up, and he said, are you God? The voice said, no, I'm the arena manager. <laughs> now, we've been all drilling <laughs> for fish where there aren't any fish. And we haven't been listening to the big arena manager who's trying to give us guidance. And we're going to talk about today why, why that happens. What's happening? And I want you to look at a couple of things. If you'll see this little figure here, right at the beginning is the starting point where the arrow is pointing. In your mind, just like you're doing with your fingers, I want you to walk up, starting at the starting point, and walk up to the top of that part, and then turn left and do it again and keep walking and see how high you get. You keep walking around in circles, winding up at the same spot, thinking you're, you're working. I mean, you're working. You have to go up every step, but you're not getting any place. That is literally what our life is like. The teachers who, who uh, wrote the book that we talk about a lot, Ask It Is Given, wrote another book earlier. It was called New Beginnings 2. And Esther Hicks, who's the channel for Abraham, told this story. She lived across the street uh, from an insane asylum. And she was watching what the people did. Every Monday morning, they came out and dug a huge hole. And then they took the dirt from that hole, they dug it in one corner of the field, and they took the dirt from that corner and moved it to the next corner. And that was, they would quit. it took them all day to do that. And the next morning, they would come, and they would uh, dig another hole, and they would move that dirt to the third corner. And the next day, they would dig, dig another hole and move it back to the original corner. And then the day after that, they would come and would fill the, each one of the holes in all the way around. And she said, it just must be terrible to be insane. I mean, the, look at the, all the things they're doing, just wasting their time digging holes and putting the dirt back in it. They don't seem to realize they're just working and working, and nothing's happening. And Abraham said to her, I'm sorry to tell you this, but that's what human beings do mostly. We're moving dirt. You are working so hard that you have no time at all to do affirmations. You have no time at all to do meditation. That's why you don't, because you're working, moving dirt. 99% of what we do does not matter. If you would just think about it, what, would, what will the world be like 100 years from now if I don't do this, if I don't mow the lawn today? Yeah, the grass will get a little higher, but so what? It is not going to have any significant change. Most of what you do is... is uh, feeding a belief system that you got between the ages of 0 and 12. Most of what we do. And if you can realize that, you can start to move along. Uh, and the other thing, the other part of that formula is that there's stuff out there that we simply are not seeing. Now, I asked everybody to have a, a pencil handy. You can just, if you need it, you can use it. But I'm going to show you some squares up here, and I want you to count them, and I'm going to ask you how many you counted. How many squares are there there? First hand up gives me the answer. 16. Anybody see any more than that? 17. I got 20. I got 21. 21, 21, 21, 21. Any more? 20 squares. Some also. How many? 22 squares. Well, figure it out. <laughs> That's the idea. Oh, you can do it. It's very easy. 22. I got 22. Do I hear any more? Who got 30? Anybody got higher than 30? 
Okay, you, I will give you $100 for everyone over 30. <laughs> okay, it is 30. Let's take a look at it. There are, of course, those 16 in red. Everybody got that part. And that's 17. Then there's one in the middle. That's 18. Okay. Now there's four of those. So we're at 22. Good for you. Four of those. That's the one that a lot of people miss. Okay. And here's the biggie that most people miss. Four of those. And those are the 16, or the 30 squares in what looked like 16. And most, we, I'm very glad somebody got that. You get an A for the class tonight. But most of us are not seeing, there's lots of other things you're not seeing. This is just an example, because we're not seeing a whole bunch of stuff that's going on. Now, you did have a paper and a pencil, I want you to do this. I want you to draw those dots in that exact configuration on your piece of paper. It'll take a minute to do this. I'll give everybody a minute to get those four dots just like that. Oh, I'm sorry, nine dots. You're right. I wanted to see if you were paying attention. Very good. Okay, your assignment is, listen carefully before you start drawing, and if you mess it up, you can draw another set and try it again. But I want you to connect all nine of these dots with four, four only, Straight lines, contiguous. Here's the thing. Well, contiguous. You can't lift your pencil up and move it. You've got to draw it in a way that you get all four in just four straight lines drawn contiguously. Okay? If anybody's got it, let me know. If you think you got it, let me know. Oh, okay, there's one. Let me, I'm just going to go down and see what you got. Show it. Show it to me. They're not all connected. The top two aren't connected. Anybody yet? Okay, you got it. All right. Let's take a look at how what it looks like. And you can practice with this after class. Here they go. I'm going to draw the lines. Line one. There's line one. St starting at the same point, that's line two. Line three and line four. Wait a minute. You cheated. You didn't say I could go outside the box. I didn't say you couldn't either. See, that's the whole idea. We want to start seeing things in a different light, in a different way. Now try this one. I'd like you to count the legs on this elephant. I mean, it's simple. Everybody knows this is easy. Five or four, it depends on, do you know what it depends on? It depends on how you look at the elephant, how many there are. And so it is in life as well. Now, there's a bunch of little black figures on there, funny looking things, and there's one of them, there's an arrow. Do you see the arrow? Everybody see the arrow? Okay, all right. Now look at all the other figures, and I want you to tell me if you can see a fly in there. One person can see a fly. Two, three, three can see a fly. I got three, four people who can see the fly. All right, I'll give you a clue. It's not a little bug. It is the word fly, F-L-Y. How many can see it now? Oh, that's almost half the room can see it. Fly, but what's the, what's the matter with the rest of you? There's a fly right there, F-L-Y. Well, let's try this. Let's zip in on it a little bit and see what happens. Ooh, yeah, there it is. It was spelled in white. You just saw it. Oh, good, good. She saw the light. She saw the fly. <laughs> Let there be fly. <laughs> just to show you, can you still see it when we take the black away? It's still there. It was there all the time. But we don't see what's actually there. These are just demonstrations, folks, but I want you to carry on in your mind that it is a, there's a whole lot of things we're not seeing. Read this to yourself. 
And then I want you to go through and count the letter Fs. Count the number of Fs. Somebody tell me how many there are. I want you to count them. It's not that hard, folks. Four? How many said four? Five. Who said six? There are six, and that was about, oh, 20% of the room got it. The ones that you're missing are in the word O-F, because you're pronouncing it of, uh, and you're thinking, because one part of your brain sees the F, and the other part of your brain is saying V for V, confusing it. The two hemispheres are not in synchronization. So that's just, you might say, part of the problem. Now, I have been a minister for about 11 years, and I can tell you that ministry is very difficult. I mean, everybody expects you to be what they think a minister should be, and it's very hard. There was this one minister who decided he wanted a Sunday off. He wanted to play golf, and he had an associate, so he said to his associate, I want you to, I want you to do the sermon this morning, and I'm just going to take off. Well, he went off on the golf course, and he, of course, was feeling a little guilty about not being in church Sunday morning, playing golf on Sunday morning. And he had one of the worst days. Everything went wrong. He, uh, his, his tees broke. He couldn't get his shots off. His score was almost double what it normally was. He was just doing terrible. He was getting more and more angry. And his caddy was kind of looking at him kind of funny. And finally, one place, he took his club and slammed it to the ground and bent it over. And he said, I give up. And the caddy said, you're giving up on golf? He said, no, the ministry. We are under a lot of strain. We are under a lot of stress. And there needs not to be that. We have a tendency to allow the stressful situations to literally rule our lives. I'm going to give you a clue as to why we're not seeing things. Why we're seeing things as so stressful when they are really not. And it's something called the reticular activating system. It's a group of cells located in the dula oblongata in the the base of your brain that literally filters every sensory input that you have. The reticular activator lets in everything of value. Now, when I say value, I don't mean value determined by somebody else. What you think is valuable, what you think is important, what you think could help you, what you think is good, it lets all that in. And it also lets in everything that you consider a threat. If you think this might hurt you, this literally allows it through and literally heightens it so that you can be aware of it. Now, it does this also. It locks out everything else. If you don't value it and you're not afraid of it, you don't see it. It's just there. You're not not feeling it. The feelings are coming through you. You're not seeing what's actually out there because it doesn't fit one of those categories, value or threat. So it only lets stuff in that you're programmed for. Now, one of the things that everybody in the world is programmed for is their name. You catch your name when it would be impossible. Imagine yourself uh, in a big party, in a huge room, and you're in a little circle of five or six people, and you're all talking. You know how it is at parties. It sounds like uh, hens cackling, and everybody's talking. And then you can cock your ear, and you can hear the little group next to your group. In fact, all the little groups around you, if you listen... You can hear what they're saying. But you can't hear what the group is saying on the other side of the room until they say your name. And you can hear your name. Someone brings up your name in a group on the other side of the room. Out of all this din, you just pick it right out. Why? Because you're set for that. Now, I'll need the, the help of the, those of you who are mothers uh, to answer this question. Just supposing, uh, as a mother, or you just know what you've been there before so you can answer this, when, uh, when the mother comes home with the baby, that first night from the hospital, and uh, she puts the baby to bed, and she gets the bottle she knows she's going to need later on already, and they go to bed, and they go to sleep. Well, in a few hours, there's this little, eh. What happens to the mother? Wakes up, pow, like this. And what happens to the father? <laughs> Sleeps right through it. And she gets up and takes care of the baby. Now, there are some families where this is reversed, but I'm just going to tell it the way that it is more often than not. So that, that mother is so attuned right from the very beginning about anything about that baby. She can hear him. She can pick his, pick his cry out in a room full of babies, literally programmed for that. Well, just supposing that this young couple 
had moved into a house that had a railroad track behind it. And the train came three times a night, and when it came through, it didn't make a lot of noise. It rocked the whole house. I mean, it was like almost like an earthquake. It came through. And the first night they moved in the house, what do you think happened to their sleep? They didn't get any. And the second night, what happened? Well, they got some fitful sleep. They woke up several times, but they went back to sleep. And the third night, well, it wasn't so bad. By the end of the week, what happens? Yeah, that train could come through there, and you don't even hear it. And someone comes in who's never stayed at your house and staying overnight. They say, how can you sleep through that racket? Your reticular activator has decided this is not a threat. It has no value. So they'll just screen it out. You can't hear the noise that is right there. Now, I'll ask the men to ask this, ask this question. What happens to this family with a baby? And they've had the baby now for a month or two. And mom needs a night off, so she's going to go out and spend some time with her friend. And, and she's going to be overnight. And daddy's going to be there with the baby. And she says to him, now when that baby wakes up, you wake up. And what happens, guys, when that baby goes, eh? You wake right up. Because you've now taken over the responsibility. And now you wake up. You didn't before, but now all of a sudden you're waking up. Because you've now programmed yourself in an instant, to wake up to hear that baby. I got a hard one for you. We had this couple, they have a new baby, and uh, mom is there, so of course she's the one that's going to be doing the waking up of the baby, starts to cry or do anything. And they're in the house, they were in the house for a long time, they're totally used to the train. Train goes by every night, they don't wake, doesn't wake them up. Even the baby's used to the train, doesn't wake the baby up. Well, it just so happens that when the train is going by at its loudest point, the baby goes a little bit, eh. what does the mother do? Wakes right up. The noise of the train does not drown out that little sound that she'd otherwise hear if the train was not going. Subconsciously, she wakes up immediately. I told this story in a seminar that I gave a few years ago, and a guy came up, he said, I have to tell you this. He said, what you're saying is absolutely true, something happened to me. My mother, who's now 93, lives with me. She's almost stone deaf. I mean, she, you have to shout in her ear to have her hear if she doesn't have her hearing aids on. Uh, and uh, she's living with me. And I'm a bachelor. And I went out one night uh, and stayed out longer than she would stay up, and uh, I forgot my house keys. And so I rang the bell, knocked on the door. I knew my mother was in there, but nothing happened. So I walked around to the back bedroom window where she was, and I knocked on the window loudly, and I screamed, Mother! Nothing happened. He said, I was about to just give up when he said, Oh, Mother, I'm home. She woke up instantly. 93 years old, but that sound never goes away when a person is programmed for it. And mothers who have 30, 40, 50-year-old children can testify to this because that is a program there. Not bad, not good, but just what it is. This reticular activating system is such a powerful force that it can screen out a train and heighten a baby's cry at the same time. It's programmed to do that. Okay, so let's take a look at your conscious and your unconscious mind. This whole slide represents your consciousness. Uh, there's your consciousness on the top of the line and your unconsciousness, what you're not aware of, what's going on down underneath the consciousness level. And what you do is something comes in from the outside, you process it, and you react to it on the outside. Let's look at that cycle. First thing that happens, you get sensory input. Somebody says something, you see something, you touch something, you taste something. There's something coming in to your conscious mind. You're aware of it. That's why we call it the conscious mind. What you immediately start to do is something called self-talk, or it could be pictures, but you're talking. You think, what does this mean? What is it? You start to think about, in the self-thinking, it doesn't have to be out loud to be self-talk, it is you're thinking about what does this mean? What is this important? And this is happening in a split second now. Then the next thing is, it creates an emotion. It stirs an appropriate emotion based on your previous experience. It goes through a little screening called your belief. You, 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 we create this filter of beliefs. And it has two functions. One is to change thoughts coming in and change thoughts coming out, but also to filter out thoughts. All right? And then you have even deeper beliefs called core beliefs. They also have a filter. So this sensory input, this emotion, is going through both of your filters, and it's being changed. And you come out with a different emotion. 
maybe a more powerful one or a lighter one, depending on what, what has been through the screening process. And then you get a feeling. Now, a feeling is something that's physical. You can actually feel it. When someone says, I have a pain in my gut, that's a feeling. You can act, it's a physical thing. But I put it right there on the line because we're usually not aware of our feelings. Most of us have tuned our feelings completely out. We react based on them, but we're not aware. We may say, I'm angry and upset, but we may not be aware of the feeling in our stomach that we're actually feeling when we're angry and upset. Okay, that feeling generates a rationalization or a justification. In other words, we start to say, well, this is the reason I have to do this. We make excuses, if you will, of why I have to do this, and then we take an action. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about justification, but justification and rationalization indicates there's something wrong, and we know it, but we're not dealing with it. Now, surrounding this whole thing is this reticular activating system that I've talked about. So it is a filter for everything. Nothing gets by unless it lets it in. And you'll notice it crosses through those belief screens. It is your beliefs that actually program the reticular activator. It isn't what's a danger, it's what you think is a danger. When someone calls you a name, if you think that's a danger, you will react just like that person is a saber-toothed tiger. You have the same chemical response from someone saying something un unkind about you. Now, if you had a totally perfect self-image and, no, and you believed that you were really okay, then what people said would not affect you at all. And if what people say does affect you, guess what? I've got some beliefs that say there's something wrong with me. It's the only way people could possibly affect you. If, if a person who's totally insane comes up to you and says, you're crazy, what do you say? <laughs> He's the one who's crazy. So what? Now, if your best friend told you that, then what? Totally different reaction. Spirit comes through from inside of all this, beyond the reticular activator, and even it, the guidance that you would be getting is blocked because of these filtering systems that we have that prevent us from having access to all the information there is in the universe. A little 10th uh, 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 grader was assigned to do a paper. And that was the whole class was assigned to do a paper. And the teacher had been talking about this for a month. And this was an important paper. It was going to mean half of their grade, what they got in the paper. And the teacher was a little worried about this particular student because he had not shown real skills about putting papers together. And she kept talking to him and making sure he was doing his work. Well, the big day came. The papers were due. And she was collecting the papers. And she walked over to this boy and said, where is your paper? And he looked up at her and he said, my dog ate it. Now, she gave him one of those looks that only teachers know how to give. Like, I've heard this answer 10,000 times before, and I really want to know what happened. And she stared at him like that. He says, no, 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 really, he ate it. I had to force him to, but he ate it. <laughs> we literally are forcing things by our justification to be the way we want them to be when they're not. Uh, Jesus made the statement, do not justify yourself before men. When you are justifying, first you're wasting your time. If you are justifying to a friend, your friend doesn't need it. If you're justifying to an enemy, they won't believe it anyway. So all justification is useless and unnecessary. But it's done for a reason. It's done for a reason that we feel, no matter what we might say we think about what we did, we feel that something is wrong, not so much with what we did, but with us. We think there's something wrong with us. So we have to constantly explain to the world why I'm like this. And every time we are explaining it, we are reinforcing that belief that we are that way, which is less than the perfect child of God, which we were created to be. And then there's times where we just can't see something. I don't know, anybody see the picture, uh, what the belief do we know? Anybody see that? This story was in that um, moving picture, but I'd heard this maybe 20 years before that. And it's a story, um, maybe a legend and maybe really true. I suspect that it is. I agree with Candace Pert in the movie who says she thought it was a true story. About the uh, Columbus landing in, in the New World, and that when he came in and parked his ships out on the water, and then they came up in little rowboats, the natives were surprised. How did they get here? They couldn't see the ships. They only saw these guys right and left. These are, must be magic people. They came out of thin air. 
They couldn't see the ships. But the medicine man, who, who was a little more curious and sort of a leader in the tribe, went out and stood on the shore and said, where did these guys come from? He asked the question. And he noticed that there was some little ripples in the water. And he kept staring at them. And as he stared and stared, finally, he noticed there were ships. And then he told all the other people there were ships. Then once they knew there were ships, they could then see them. Now, it sounds like those people must be dumb if they couldn't see ships. Do you remember that uh, a week or so ago, we had those little cards where, we, where you looked at the dot and, and you, bl- do you blank the, uh, we moved the uh, square on the card into your blind space and you discovered that you had a blind space in each eye and you didn't know that? That doesn't make you dumb, but that makes you just like those Indians. It was something you didn't know was there. And there are so many of those for all of us. Here's what happens when we see something. There's an object out there like this tree. And the tree makes a similar object, like a camera does, on the back. And I should have it upside down because that's really the way it is. Uh, and that, that tree, uh, the picture of a tree is there. And then the optic nerve changes that picture into vibrations and passes it to the brain. And we create another picture. And that's our picture of the tree. Now, Ten different people, the inside tree would look a little different for each person because it's been filtered through their system. Now, if we didn't know the trees existed, we might see the forest, but we wouldn't see the tree. So if the reticular activator comes in, our eyes are seeing things. They're actually picking up the, the vibrations, the light waves, but we're not seeing it in our mind. And that's for everybody. You know, you cannot, uh, if you, if you look at something, uh, let's say a person who's very practiced at watching a football game, they're going to see a lot more of the game than somebody who's a first-timer. They're going to see a whole lot more because they're expecting all these different plays. They know about them. The newbie says, well, what happened? How did he get the ball? And that's all of us. When we, when we only see what we're used to, what we're programmed to see. Have you ever been in a place that had a popcorn ceiling? You know what I mean by a popcorn ceiling? and you, you looked up at it, and you were laying in bed, and you just stared at it and stared at it, and all of a sudden you can see a little face here and a little something here, cat over here. There's no cats and no faces in the popcorn ceiling. But your mind is making up because it has to. It is always, I've got to make sense out of everything. So it always tries to put things into something you believe. We've all done it with clouds. You're looking up at a bunch of clouds, and, and, and the person you with says, oh, look at that dog up there, and you look at it and say, that's not a dog, the tail's swimming. it must be a cat. Okay, because we were going to see your hands being raised. There are no cats and no dogs, even though it may rain cats and dogs, there are no cats and dogs up there in the clouds. But we make the clouds in our minds to that. And we're making up a whole bunch of the rest of our lives. So let's take a look at this thing we call mind. And we're going to divide it into some areas. Now, in reality, you only have one mind. <laughs> if you really want to know the truth, there is only one mind, period. But we're going to talk about it from your point of view. The top area is, represents your conscious mind. That's what you are aware of. You can actually be aware of it. I'm saying words, you listen to words, you're aware of it. That's going on in the conscious mind. But then in the subconscious mind, which is below your area of consciousness, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Feelings and emotions are being generated Uh, Laughter may be generated, crying may be generated, all sorts of things are generated down there. And then down even farther is something that Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. Fillmore referred to this as the race consciousness. Same idea. It's all the ideas of all the human race down there in that area, which we have access to if we could. And then below that is the superconscious, which is all the ideas that ever were all the ideas that are now and all the ideas that will ever be. Just unmanifest, but they're all there. Anything you need, you can pull out of that if you have the right way to do it. Now, in this little thing, we have a filter. That first filter between the conscious and the collective unconscious is called our BS filter. Now, you know what BS is. It's belief system. We've told you that before. And we all defend our belief system. That's important. But there's another one. 
And that is, we'll call that the race consciousness filter. That's the filter we all as a group see through. And uh, we are affected by that as well as our own. So what happens when, when an idea is trying to come from the superconscious, it may not penetrate this filter that's filtered so thick, like a dirty filter, that it just can't get through to the race consciousness as well as to any individual. Then other ideas may get through the race consciousness, but then they're stopped by our own uh, set of belief systems. And still other ideas get through them both, but they don't come out the same. They are changed by going through the filter. So our chances of getting anything really pure out of the superconscious are very slim because we have so many layers to go through. So we need to ask our question, what can we do about that? Well, there's a number of things we can do about that. We've given you some of them. Affirmations. S using subliminal affirmations, NLP and Psyche K are four techniques that do something. This is what they do. They cut little holes through your belief system. Uh, you can see on the left side of your screen, there's a little hole, and there's one that can actually all the way down to the superconscious. And if you can cut a hole, and this is, when I say cut a hole, you can believe a certain thing is true that you didn't believe before, and that makes a passageway for the superconscious to give you ammunition and energy about that. So when that hole is there, stuff that's trying to get through, at least on that subject, can get through. So you can say, well, well, if I do this for one subject, do I have to do anything else? Yeah, for every subject. You'd have to cut a hole for every single one of those areas that you're working with. And yes, you can do that. And those are the four techniques. The fastest uh, NLP and Psyche K are two ways to change beliefs in a hurry. Uh, I've done, been doing NLP for about 27 years, and I have people who I worked on 20 years ago and come back and say, you know, that's still working. I would say more than 100 individuals who were petrified of snakes. I've done this demonstration on a stage with two or 300 people in the audience taking a person who, who, when you showed them a picture in a book of a snake, went, just like you could see the reaction to a picture in the book. And in 15 minutes, had my wife bring up a live snake, hand it to them and have them petting it. A live snake. Now, the reason I had so many snakes is my uh, oldest son kept snakes. NLP is neuro-linguistic programming. It does take an outside operator, but it's, it's a way, particularly, it works very good with traumas and other things. I'll explain it a little more. But you can change these tremendous beliefs in a short time by using the right techniques. And you can change them without any outside help if you'll use things like affirmations and something else I'm going to tell you. Okay? Let's take another way to get this, uh, these barriers out of our ways. A different approach, but still valid and still important using meditation and pivoting, and pivoting, as I mentioned, you are going to be learning in the, in the uh, I think it's the, the next to the last lesson that we have, but it's very important that you start conditioning your mind before you start practicing pivoting because you won't stay with the pivoting unless you've really been convinced and really seen some results to begin with in order to stick with the pivoting long enough for it to work. Uh, what that does, though, instead of cutting holes, is that actually narrows these bands. It makes them less wide. And the, less wi the, the, the narrower these bands of beliefs are, the easier it is for things to come through, or the easier it is to cut a hole in them. So both techniques, and it's why we're advising you, start doing your meditation. Make sure you're doing your affirmation. The 12 affirmations that we gave you are critical because they are, they are aimed at the most destructive beliefs that we have. And if you can start seeing the results from that, and everybody does, that uses them, they see the results. I'll give you another little sort of caveat. If you decide to go into this work on a full-time basis, in order you make this really your life's work, you're going to have, uh, like the lady that I told you about, uh, who found Mr. Right and he turned out to be Mr. Wrong, you're going to have those experiences even after you've started to do this. Because every one of those experiences are being generated by your own subconscious mind for one purpose only, not to hurt you, but to show you, you've still got another one down there. Work on this guy. Work on this thing. So that's the reason that we're saying to you, no matter what's happening out there, continue this process. It gets better and better and better. And it will get better to a point, if you stop, it'll stay better for a while, but it'll start to drop off if you stop doing your work. 
Interestingly enough, uh, with uh, Psyche, you can permanently eliminate a belief. And I've seen this syndrome over and over again. Go through a session with somebody, and they'll come out of that flying high, and everything is wonderful, everything is perfect, and things work great for four or five days. And they come back a week later and says, well, it worked real good at first, but now this and this and this is happening. Well, this is what's happening. They were carrying around 2,000 pounds of negative beliefs, and the session knocked off 200 pounds. And when they left, they felt, wow, this is just great. But after a week, they began to feel the 1,800 pounds that was left. So they have another session, another 200 pounds, and then they up again. It is a matter of cleaning that off again and again and again. Have you ever been in one of those restaurants where, well, like a, uh, a cafeteria where they have the plates, and they're in, this little, they're in a pile that when you pull one plate off, another one comes up? Seen those machines? That's the way it is with your beliefs. You, you get rid of one, another one comes up. Get rid of another one, it comes up. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. It isn't important for you to get to the bottom of the sack of plates. It's important to keep taking plates off because every time you take a plate off, your life gets better. So you continue the process for how long? Forever. At least as long as you're in the time-space continuum. Maybe you do afterwards. I only know about being here. But the more you do that, the better your life gets. Now, let's take a look at a belief, and what is a belief? We've been talking about our BS, our belief system. But here's a definition I think that's a good one. That which we hold to be true because we don't know what's true. That which we hold to be true because we don't really know. And I want to tell you this. People, we call ourselves in Unity Truth students. You are never, ever, 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 ever going to know the truth. You're going to know a better truth than you know now, and later a better one and a better one. But you will never know the complete entire truth. Not until you take over the entire universe, but you'll never know the complete truth. So when someone says to me, I know the truth, I say, good for you. Good for you. Live it until it breaks, and then do some more work. And your truth is fine. Nothing wrong with your truth. It is your truth. But understand, it needs to be changing, improving, and expanding all the time. And then this, we, we believe because it's too frightening not to know. Do you realize that we are more frightened of not knowing than anything else? And yet, the only way the superconscious can get through to you is when you don't know. When you say, oh, I know this, I know how to do this, it says, fine, go ahead. And when it breaks... Oh, I thought I knew how to do this. Oh, but I know another one. I'll do it this way. Superconscious is good. It breaks. And finally you say, I give up. The answer comes right up. You've done it. I mean, you've experienced this where you've tried and tried and tried and tried to do something, and then you just gave up, and all of a sudden it fell together. Anybody ever done that? Come on. Okay, most of us. So it is being in this state of not knowing that is the powerful state. If you talk to any real sages like the Dalai Lama, he answers questions more often I don't know than any other person I know. He doesn't know, and that's why he knows. When you don't know, you are, you are tapping in to the place that does know it all. And it will give you what you focus on, whatever that is. This is my friend, uh, Fred Allen Wolf. I got to spend some time with him uh, down in Miami a few years ago. And he says this, and I agree with him. Don't be in the know, be in the mystery. Don't be in the know, be in the mystery. When you don't know, you're open to spirit. That's a great place to be. It's a lot less stressful. So, we have all these beliefs. How were they created? Well, several ways. I'm glad you came because we're going to talk about that. If you focus on something, and you repeat it, and you have some emotion with it, and you say it over and over again, and something happens to you, and you tell your story over and over and over again, or you have the experience over and over again, or you talk about it over and over again, or you gossip about it over and over again, you build, over a period of time, a belief. And that belief begins to take over. It begins to regulate 
your, your reticular activating system and begins to run your life just like your reticular activating system is doing all along, only it runs it according to the new belief. Now, <clears throat> there are some ways to get rid of beliefs, but mostly when you're working with yourself, we don't get rid of beliefs so much as we create new ones. You have a bad negative belief, you realize it, start creating a new belief that's what you want and focus all of your attention all of your energy on what you want and none of your energy on this belief, even though this belief is creating situations in your life. If you remember the slide we had with the little man with the, with the, with the projector on his head and how his beliefs were shooting onto the screen, well, your old beliefs are going to play out on the screen of life while you're creating the new one, and you just have to ignore them, literally ignore them. If you have to do something about them, do it, but get away from them as quick as you can and don't even give it Tell a story to anybody once. Don't spend any time talking about what happened in your life that's wrong unless you want it again. Now, if you concentrate on what you want and pay no attention to that little man behind the screen, remember in The Wizard of Oz, the guy behind the screen who was pulling all the levers? You don't pay any attention to those old beliefs. And if you do, something marvelous happens by themselves because of lack of attention, because they're not getting any energy from you, they shrink all by themselves. And now it makes it easy for you to operate on the new, the good, the big belief. Now, there's one of the ways we get beliefs, and they come in very quickly, and they're traumas. We can have a situation that's highly emotional, and boom, we have a belief right away. You can uh, have a, a, a terrible, traumatic situation happen to you, and when you were never afraid, you're all of a sudden afraid of certain things because of that thing that happened just once, not repetition over and over again. Now, things like... Uh, Phobias and uh, fearfulness and, and failure syndrome and self-sabotage, the real obvious big ones, they almost all come from traumas. Mostly traumas that happened to us in that first two, three, four, five, six, seven years, early childhood. And we've got those beliefs in there. Those are the kind of beliefs that I would suggest that you use something like Psyche or NLP to get out because they can be gotten out in 15 minutes. And you, I, I suppose you could get them out by repeating the opposite uh, uh, affirmations over and over again. I never had anybody have had that work. They couldn't last longer. because These are very emotionally packed. So it's important to get them taken out. And most people have a few of these, but not a lot. But they can be literally career stoppers. They can block you from having what you want. Uh, those are the suggestions, uh, methods for using uh, on those trauma-induced beliefs. So there's two kinds of beliefs, trauma-induced, which are big emotional beliefs like phobias, they're the best example, or the ordinary debilitating beliefs we have that got this through repetition over a long period of time. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something. We're going to have another test here, but this is easy. You don't even need your pencil and paper. Uh, I'm going to get you to look at some things, but this is we're going to talk about your power of concentration. The most, hard, the most difficult thing for people to do is concentrate. So we're going to give you a little practice here. You'll see on the screen, <clears throat> there are a bunch of colors, see all those colors on there? In the very middle, there's a dot. Now, your job, your assignment, is to focus on that dot, and I mean like stare at it, like you're trying to put your whole self into the dot. And don't pay any attention to the colors. Focus only on the dot. What's happening? The colors disappear. How many got the colors to disappear completely? How many got them to fade a little? Everybody got them at least to fade a little. If you focus on this long enough, they'll fade. The ability to, to focus on what you want and not be distracted by all that stuff out there is the key to retraining your mind. Will you focus on your affirmations? Uh, will you focus on your meditation? Will you make that more important than all the things out there? that are taking up your time, 90% of them, which are unproductive. Um, there's a fellow by the name of Pietro. He was an, uh, a, a, uh, an economist in, in the 17th century, and he came up with Pietro's principle. Everybody heard of Pietro's principle? Yes, you have, but you've heard of it under another uh, name, the 80-20 rule. How many have heard of the 80-20 rule? Oh, everybody heard of that one. It means that 80% of your time only produces 20% of the, 
of what you want, and 20% of your time, the other 20%, produces the 80% of what you have. It's the 80-20 principle. And I don't care where you are. Go into a sales organization and take the top 20% of the salespeople. They're doing 80% of the business. And take the other 80%, they're doing 20%. I don't care what place you go to. This principle holds pretty well true in almost everything. I've worked with a lot. I, I worked in my company and got it all the way to uh, where 40% of the people were producing uh, 80% of the business. And that was a real, real shift in consciousness to get them to do that. But for most of us, we're spending, if, if, you, just, if you didn't do the, uh, let's say you spent um, five more percent in the 20% time, now you do it spending 25%, you'd, you'd accomplish everything you would have in the whole day. You can throw the other 75% of the stuff you're doing away. You could use it for meditation. You could use it for affirmations. You could use it for something that will really change your life if you can realize that most of what we do is what Abraham called moving dirt. So start to look at your life from the moving dirt point of view. Okay, a little more color. You can notice that the first color up there says yellow, but the color is green. I mean, the, the color of the word yellow is green. Everybody see that? And the next, the next word says blue, but it is actually uh, red. So what I'm going to want you to do is to read them, not the words. Just wait a minute. I'll try to go through it once myself. The first one is green, red, blue, orange, blue, black, red, blue, green, black, uh, red, yellow, green, blue, black, Blue, red, green, right? Now try that. A little higher than it looks, isn't it? Now you see, we, we have two minds. We actually have a lot more minds than two, but, but we have two hemispheres in our brain. And one of them sees things spatially, and the other sees, sees things logically, step by step. And those two are fighting here. One wants to read the words, and the other wants to see the colors. And as a fact, I would say the mainstay of what uh, um, Psyche does is to integrate those two hemispheres, those two minds, so that both are working for you instead of against you, as they are in this demonstration. What we have in our lives is something that I would like to call mental mind decay, mind decay. And what we're going to need to do is get some mental floss to get rid of some of the mind decay. There they, this is, these are the big decay ones. The negative core beliefs. And I would say that most everybody has these beliefs. There may be somebody in here, uh, let me see the holes in your hands if there are, uh, that don't have these beliefs. There are negative core beliefs, and all of the adversities that humans face can be traced to the effects of negative core beliefs. Everything, the wars, the divorces, all the things come from the negative core beliefs. And here they are. Guilt. Guilt is a terrible thing. And this is just as bad, shame. And yet our society teaches us with guilt and shame. Guilt and shame have only two functions. That's to control other people. That's why we use it on our kids. Guilt and shame have only those functions. Well, someone said to me, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. You know, if I didn't have guilt and shame, I might go out and do something really bad. Huh? You would? But what if you were in touch with spirit? There is nothing that spirit would ever do to hurt you or anybody else. You can hurt other people and you can hurt yourself. But there's nothing that spirit would do. If you were coming from there, you certainly wouldn't need these two bears. You wouldn't need uh, guilt and shame at all if you were coming from spirit. Now, here's the problem. We imposed these over the last 5,000 years in order to control people because people weren't doing what the leaders wanted them to do. You've got to go through them. You got to get rid of, if you've got them now, and most of us do, you have to get through those ideas before you can really get in touch with spirit. And spirit is going to guide you, and you will not do anything that's hurtful for yourself or anybody else if you're operating from spirit. You can only do that from the egoic mind. Another class we'll have. 
And then there's this, one of my favorites, blame. The next lesson that we do is called the blame game. We're going to find out how to stop blaming, because blaming is a devastating thing. If you blame your, yourself or someone else, it's hurtful to everybody. No matter who you, it doesn't matter who you blame. Blaming itself is the culprit. And then this biggie, unworthiness. The fact that you have accepted in any way, shape, or form that you are somehow unworthy. Now, this is a hard one to accept because there are people who say, oh, I'm perfect, and they're running over people like steam, steamrollers, just flattening them and saying, I'm perfect, anything I do is right. I'm not talking about it. Those are people who have a very, very deep guilt, or they wouldn't be doing that. I am talking about the idea that there's something that I have to do to make myself a better person. There is nothing. There's nothing you can do. You're already made perfectly. Now, you can be perfectly awful. You, you have, you've been made perfectly, and you've been given free will. You've been given choices. What is wrong, quote, with you, if anything, is the choices you're making. That's all. You're just making choices that don't give you what you want, that aren't right for you, aren't right for the world. You're making choices. And the only thing you need to do is make another choice. The word that is translated into English as repent, metanoia, doesn't mean to feel sorry for what you did wrong. doesn't mean that. It's not the meaning at all. It means to change your mind. Repent. Rethink. Rethink. If you did something and it didn't turn out the way you wanted to, it turned out wrong, then what do you do? You say, oh, I'm not going to do that again. What should I do next? Not one thought about what you did wrong. Now, if you made a mess, you may have to clean it up. But with no blame, no guilt, and no shame. Okay, I'll straighten this out, and then I'm moving on. With as little time spent thinking about what's wrong in your life as you can possibly do. And start thinking about what's right in your life, what's already right. Focus on what's good and kind and caring. I think Paul said something like this. In your life now, and then focus on what you want with the same gusto that you'd focus on it as if it was already true. That's what changes your life. You are responsible for what seems to be happening in your life. And I said seems because what you think is happening isn't happening. Something else is happening. But you are responsible for it. But I'd rather change that word responsible, which has this idea of guilt or blame in it, to this word, response able. You should be response able no matter what happens. No matter what happens, okay, that happened, that's it here. Now what do I do? What am I going to do that was different and better so that the next thing that comes in my path will be what I want to happen? Response able. How many would agree to become response able? Good. There was a fellow who came home, um, and he said to his wife, Honey, I've got great news. I'm going to get a raise. In fact, they're raising my salary double. They're going to give me twice as much money. She says, that's wonderful. And she said, by the way, when does the raise take effect? He said, well, you know, I never looked. So he opened up the envelope, and it said these words. This raise will become effective when you do. Look. Your life <laughs> will become effective when you start to do the practices that will change the way you think. There was a minister who was uh, getting ready to write his Sunday sermon, and he had a five-year-old son, and he knew that the kid would be in and out all day. Mother was gone. He had to watch the kid. So he got him a puzzle, and he put the puzzle down. He said, now, son, this is a puzzle of the world, and I want you to put the world together. And he knew it would take him at least an hour or two to do the puzzle. And he went in, and five minutes, the kid came in and said, okay, Daddy, I've got it done. He said, you do? And he walked out, and sure enough, there was the world completely together, every piece where it should be. He said, how do you do that that fast? And he said, well, turn the puzzle over. He said, on the, on the back side, there's a picture of a man. And when I put the man together, the world came together as well. When you put yourself together, your world will come together. I bless you all.